I think the big question really is, why are any of you here? And it really is only an answer that you know. I think there are a lot of reasons to pursue a meditative life or a spiritual life. For me, it was an awareness through chemistry that the world that I knew through my eyes and my nose and my ears was a pale comparison to something much bigger out there. It was a, <clears throat> a journey in the 1960s into the, the, cosmo, the cosmos, in the ultimate cosmos. And it was very interesting to me because the world as we know it was the first thing to go away. It was like, gone. My life, my story, the world, everything, gone. It was just so much bigger than the planet Earth, so much bigger than, <clears throat> than our story, than our life, than our collective experience. When that was all over, and I've documented this story many places, but when it was all over, which took like, I keep saying, three to four billion years, and I returned to some semblance of this, and I kept saying, why, why am I back here? And the voice that spoke to me said to tell people what you saw. And that's what I'm doing. It's why I'm here. It's what I'm about. It's why I came back. <clears throat> Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, a lot of people are brought to this kind of work because life is insufferable. Just really painful. Hard road. Bad parenting bad circumstances, you have issues and you want some resolution, you want some peace of mind, some sense of stability in a world that's really kind of insane. And so you take to the idea of meditation. It promises to reduce stress, to help you see past the obstacles of your life, the suffering of your life. And it works. It really does work. And, and you sit down and you actually go into a place inside where for a given period of time that stuff doesn't matter. It may also give you a little bit of a glimpse into what I experienced in my psychedelic journey um, of the vastness of the existence. And also how invisible we are in that existence. Invisible in a way not that we don't have a personal experience of it, but that it is so vast, so infinite, so eternal, so beyond our conception of anything, that what we are to it is really like an ant in a, in a little ant hole 45 miles from here. Trust me, you're not empathizing with that ant. It's not part of your life experience. And that ant may think he's the most important ant in the, in the universe, but in the larger scope of things, it really is very small, and we are very small. But underlying our issues, underlying our personal drama, our journey of the day-to-day, -day, with stuff that's not working out and hopes that it will work out soon, and plans for the future, and knowing that we're going to finally get there if we only get this or get that, or find this one or find that one. We always constantly look for the solution to our problems and really, in a way, something we might call happiness. And happiness will f finally come, maybe, if we do this and do that. And a lot of us actually get happiness at very mo various moments in our life. We meet the right person. We get the right job. We suddenly get a raise. These things happen in our life and we feel like, oh, God, I finally got there. I'm finally there. Or the new car you buy. You know, I always had this theory, you should get your new car scratched on day one, and then you can really enjoy your car. Because otherwise it's always worrying about when's, it gonna, when's somebody going to do something and sideswipe me in the parking lot. Get it done with. Get your suffering out of the way as fast as you can. Happiness is short-lived. It doesn't continue because the world is inconstant and always changing. 
always. Whatever you get, you're going to lose. Whatever you lose, something else will come. It never stops. On and on and on. So if you have a very strong belief system that meditation will finally get you to some permanence in a world of absolute impermanence, you're up the wrong tree. It's not going to happen. You're not going to find your way. You're thinking, oh my God, I finally found peace and quiet. However, if I dare step outside the cave or the meditation hall or whatever, then it's dangerous. I'm fine when I'm just in this deep place of, of surrender. But you can't live there. You can't, you can't live in a cave. People do. They have done. You know, there are people who, Buddha meditated under a tree for years, you know, and it got tiresome. And it didn't give him anything he was looking for. In fact, it taught him an incredibly great lesson that life is impermanent and everything keeps changing. And the path through life is not in the extremities, it's right through the middle. In other words, live your life. Have your life. Your life, Rudy never tired of saying, is your spiritual life. This life is your spiritual life. In other words, the problems are part of your life and part of your spiritual development. The difficulties, the unhappiness, the struggles are all built into the system. They have to happen. So if you're meditating to get out of the system, if you're meditating to be free of all of this, it's not going to happen. You're going to be very upset. You're going to go, why am, I, why am I wasting my time on this? Which is a really good question. However, there's something that happens in meditation. And I will call it allowing. There's a kind of allowing of what is to be. You simply go, okay, this is what it is. You know, I have forever told the story of my mother-in-law who on her deathbed, and I walked in the room in the last moments of her life, and she looked at me and she went, that's what we're all aiming for. What are you going to do? What you're going to do is just go, yes. It's about, some people call it radical acceptance. Saying yes to the what is of life, rather than no. Rather than thinking life is going to make it better that somehow circumstances are going to get you there. That's a real problem because you're going to be frustrated. You're really going to be frustrated trying to find the right circumstances or living in circumstances that are just awful and you know there's no way out and it's going to be like this forever and it's like horrific sadness that, and grief that comes upon many people in their lives. And what's your choice in those moments? Well, to get out of life, maybe, which won't, in the Buddhist sense, end anything. It will just prolong it in some infinite way. The choice is to go, even this, even this, yes. I accept this. I accept whatever I have found my life to be, good or bad or indifferent, whatever is happening at any given moment. And here's the remarkable thing when you do that. There is a sense of, oh, in other words, you're not fighting it. You're not fighting your own structure. You're not fighting your own demons. You're not fighting your dramas. You're just going, oh, okay. And what happens is really interesting. The demons don't go anywhere. They just get quiet. You don't, they don't have to interfere with your life because you're not paying attention to them. The only reason demons interfere with you is because you energize them. You give them power and strength. You go, ha! Ah! to a dream and it goes ah, to you. It's a kind of a constant feedback loop that you just keep em emphasizing and it's miserable. It's really miserable. So here we are all trying to get something that is an effort of trying to transform the things around us when all that has to happen is you need to transform your reaction to the things around you. Not the thing it's you that has to change. And the thing that has to happen is very simple. Just go yes to what is. Just go yes. Not a big deal. It's actually very simple. It takes training. It takes effort. It takes practice. But it's amazing when you do it. You really get good at it. And you stop fighting 
You stop fighting your life. You stop fighting the drama of your life and you start to go, this is what I am, this is what I want, this, whatever this is. So why do you come here? Why do you come here? Probably for a number of reasons. One of them is to hear what I'm saying. Because in the moment it appears to be meaningful. It may not be meaningful to you in 20 minutes, but right now there's an openness that you are hearing this idea and it feels like, oh, yeah, accept it. Just accept it. You know, first of all, everything changes. So even if you accept the fact that your back is hurting and you wish you were sleeping or lying down or outside doing something, you go, I can take another five minutes of him talking or 20 minutes or whatever it will be. It will be work. On some level, you'll just have to go, okay, okay, okay. But you do that, and in the process of doing that, one time passes, resistance disappears, and you actually start to feel kind of good. It's really, it's really wonderful. And the more you just accept the what isness of your life, the more you start to find joy in being. True joy in just being alive. And that may be one of the things that is eluding you. Because in the story of your life, there's all these difficulties and all these issues. But underlying the story, underlying the issues, there is this extraordinary place of well-being. It's part of the human being. Human being has deep within it well-being. And it is below the level and below the surface of your day-to-day -day stuff. If you're lugging your stuff around all the time, and chewing on it in the middle of the night, you know, like a dog with an old bone. It's, it's going to drive you crazy. It's going to drive you crazy. All you have to do is stop gnawing. It's hard because it's a habit. It's habitual. We all have habits that are really awful, that we've done for years and years, and they have a certain familiarity, and that familiarity is very cozy. And we all like to be cozy, even with the stuff we don't like. So. A lot of people just muddle through the day, muddle through their lives. Okay, I can get through. You know, and in a way that's kind of extraordinary. In a way that's kind of at the essence of being human. I mean, I was watching people on the streets of New York the other day, just walking by a window we were sitting at. The one commonality, because they all had dramas, they all had stuff going on. People were trying to sell people rides on these non-stop, or these buses that stop everywhere, and there were other people trying to figure out how to get to the corner, what, what, you know, what, how to get across the street. I mean, there people, what weird dramas going on. And I'm, but I'm watching all these people, and they're so in it. They're so engaged by it. This is their life. Nobody was sitting around saying, why is life unfair to me? They really weren't. They were just living out their life, plodding along. And I thought, wow. Underneath all of the stuff of life, there is this extraordinary sense of, I am. I am. And it's so assured. It's so absolute. I am. I exist. And there was a kind of knowing. Everybody was heading somewhere. They, everyone seemed to have goals on some level. Everyone had an agenda. They had something that drove them from place to place and thing to thing. And they seemed like they knew what and who they were. And in truth, none of us know what and who we are in the deepest sense, but we have an incredible attunement to our human beingness. We're just attuned to it, and we're very comfortable in, I gotta, gotta catch the bus, I gotta get the homework done, I've gotta get to the Olympics. I, I, whatever your thing is, you know, everybody's got their thing and it keeps them going step by step by step and day by day, and there's something very calming about that very assuring, very sweet, very beautiful. And I looked at this and all these people, and as much as they had huge dramas going on, they were at home in being. And I was very moved by it. I was very moved by watching all these people. And I could tell, I said to Blanche, every one of these people has a three-act play in them. Every one of them is a huge story going on. And yet, underneath that story was something that you guys are discovering. And that is that this human being, this space of being within you, is vibrant and alive and bigger than you. It's really comfortable. You really are, in spite of all of your stuff, 
deeply comfortable in being. And the truth of it is you wouldn't trade it for anything. You would not trade this being for anything. And those few of you who might say that's not true, then you'll be more, more, how can I say, motivated to work this system, work it, work it more deeply. Going really deep into your meditative life is a kind of finding that humanness existence, that human space that feels like it's why we're here. It's why we're in the world and it's why we're in this room. Because we're looking for that undercurrent of knowing I am. I am. And that's really what we're here for. You want to know I am. You want it acknowledged. You want it reinforced. Not that I am this or I am that. Because that's where you get in trouble. Just that I am. And the I am is vast. The I am is not limited by your story, by your physical body, by your emotional life, by the stuff that was done to you 20 years ago, by the stuff you haven't achieved and may never get to. The I am is impervious to that. The I am is this. And it's really present tense and you're all feeling it. You're all feeling it. And coming here is an opportunity to settle into I am. And the wonderful thing about I am, especially in a group setting like this, is that the borders of you don't stop at the edge of your body or when it hits the next person next to you. I am somehow spreads through the space of the room. In a way you could say we are, but in truth it really is I am because it's a singular. It's not a plural. We appear to be plural to each other. But we are one thing, like all my fingers may think they're separate, but they're connected to the hand. They're part of the hand. We are each part of the hands of existence. We are this extraordinary living entity that is, that has life, and may in fact have what we call eternal life. I really, if I had to vote for it, would tell you, you're going to be here forever. So relax, settle in, open up to the eternal now, open up to the present tense, open up to this because this is all there is. And one of the remarkable things about becoming I am is the realization that I am has no past tense and no future tense. It just is. And the isness of it is manifesting instant to instant, moment to moment. Hard to explain, hard to understand, and hard to believe, but nothing existed before this second and nothing exists beyond it. This is an absolute imprint of totality, of the universe itself. It is everything right now. And if you just stop the game of playing future and past, if you just settle in and get rid of your issues, get rid of your dramas, get rid of everything that's annoying you, and just sit. You will feel this thing go... It's I am. It's what you are. It's the truth of your being. Everything you've been looking for from day one, everything you've ever wanted right here, right now, always. You're not looking for something tomorrow, in the future. You're not trying to resolve the past. You don't have to. The past is present. The future is present. It's all right in this space. All of your issues are right here. All of your dramas are right here. All of your unhappiness and all of your joy. If you can sit quietly in it, one after another, they just pop away. And then you're just here. Just I am. And the I am is total presence. Total present tense. Absolute isness. This is not something you have to arrive at when you die. It's not something you have to work for to get strong enough or pure enough to recognize or to own. It's there right now. So if you are sitting here questioning what I'm saying, 
you're fighting what is. If you're sitting here denying what I'm saying, or what's he talking about, you're in your mind and you're cut off from the truth. If you're here frustrated because you have a sore back or, or you know, issues in, of one kind or another that have caught your attention, then you're caught. You're just caught. And the, the simple advice to you is just go, okay, I'm caught. Accept it. Once you accept it in the kind of radical way of going, okay, there's no issues, and you're right back again here. I'm telling you, that's your whole spiritual practice. That's the whole thing. There's nothing else to do. If you're thinking you're going to get there in 10 years, you are wasting 10 years. Why do you think you have to do that? I mean, look, on some level, you do have to do that. <clears throat> on some level, you have to atone for past sins, I guess. <clears throat> you have to do the thing inside, say the thing to the person you didn't say it to, tell the person you love them, tell them you were sorry for what you did or didn't do. Maybe you have to get rid of all that stuff. That's not a bad thing. Part of the being I am is there's a deep instruction in it that tells you, tell the truth, fix past tense, fix stuff that was broken, get it together, and move forward. It really is very much an injunction of present tense experience. But you can also really get into a space that is so full of self, so vast in its truth, that your personal life is absolutely un un unimportant. You can really go there. One of the things Taoists call this life is uh, a dream. This is a dream. It's an illusion. And there's some absolute truth to that. And I've described a lot recently, my, my son is very involved in virtual reality. And so I've been doing a lot of virtual reality exploring. A, a long talk some other time. But I will tell you, one of the incredible things about virtual reality is how much this place is a virtual reality. You truly understand, once you've seen what virtual reality is, that this is not much different. It's only you can't take these goggles off so easily. But this is a reality that is temporary, virtual, dreamlike, fantastical, and it has as much truth to it as you want to give it. The Taoists basically say, wake up wake up. The one thing I think that's important is to recognize how caught we are by the dream, how invested we are in the dream, and how much we suffer or enjoy the dream. And we don't want to wake up. Most of us do not want to wake up. We don't even believe it's a possibility, really. But those of you who have arrived in this room, who are listening to this talk, you have come to this because you are ready to know that waking up is possible. Waking up is not a waking up that will happen later. It can happen and should happen now. I've talked about this every time I've come to this space here in Big India. I keep saying, do it right now. You know, we're done. Do it. Finished. And every one of you looks at me like, but, but, and, and, and there's no answer to the but. You all have one. And there's always a reason why you can't do it right now at this very second. But I'm telling you, yes, you can. You can go like that. Let me know if you've done it. But if you, if you don't do it, talking about this as a dream is very frustrating because it's a dream that has unbelievable weight to it and power in it and frustration in it and goals in it and things you want and things you suffer and grief and hope and all of that stuff. It's very, very powerful. And so this dream that we're in, you can say it's a dream and go, poof, it's gone. Or you have to do the work. And what is the work? The work is sitting down in the middle of the dream, bringing yourself into some place of stillness, going deep into your own inner centers and just start to say, I accept what is. Just doing that starts to bring the waking up process into play. You just say yes to this. Yes, yes, yes. Even this, even this, even this. 
and this awakening will occur. And then when you start to realize that it's a dream, it will be with a profound appreciation and sadness. One, sadness because you've invested all these years in a dream. Sadness because everyone around you is still dreaming. And yet this profound awareness that let go of the dream and what happens is all the stuff that burdened you goes away and what remains is everything. Absolutely everything. By losing yourself, you get all there is. I know that sounds crazy. Lose yourself and you will have everything. But that's really what comes of this. And what is everything? Well, it's probably a bigger dream. So this is not a process that just gets done. I mean, I thought upon awakening that I was finished and then the discovery was, oh my God, I'm beginning. I'm just beginning. It's just happening. This thing is just going on. It's just getting bigger and bigger. It's flowering. It's expanding. It's encompassing and it grows and it grows. And the awe and the joy and the amazement and the ecstasy of it, the, the gratitude that fills you is unending. That's what we're aiming at. That's what we're all aiming at. It's a gift I could give you like that if you would trust me or listen to me or do it. It's only you holding on. It's only you holding on to that burden that you carry with you every day with such passion. This is what I am and who I am and how I am. And my parents did this and my so-and-so did that. And I All you have to do is go, whoop, done, let it go. You know, my mother-in-law, sitting on her deathbed, 93, sitting there, it took her 93 years, but she got there. You can get there now, truly, just, it's okay. Let it go and watch what happens. I can only say this so many times in so many different ways, and you're probably going, okay, I get it, I get it. But getting it isn't the answer. It's not the answer. Doing it is the answer. Doing it. Do it. Do it. Be it. You are it. Take a breath and let the world fall away. Let the dream end. Find yourself to be what you've always been. And this enormous gratitude will fill you. This thank you will fill space and time. And you will have a different life. It's not the end of life. There's more coming. But it will not be your life. It will be life itself. It is the life. We're all in life. We are all one with life. That's the journey. We're all on it. Not to know that is to live in a, in a very, very limited, limited dream. So, you know, I come to Big Indian and I make I, probably the same speech. If you play all the speeches that I've done here over the course of uh, the years I've been coming, it's called Do It Now. Do it. Do it. Be it. Wake up. It ain't that hard. It's actually the simplest thing in the world. It's just, we're not simple. We're so crazily complex. But it's really simple. So again, find your I am and you will find joy. Any questions? This is very basic. It's a stupid question, I'm sure. But what is the difference between awakening and enlightenment? Nothing. Nothing. Enlightenment is to lighten the load, really, or to have it fall away. Awakening is to wake up to the load that was never there. You know, I mean, that's one of the great teachings of the non-dualistic school, is there is no you. And everybody who's walking around suffering the you is in a deluded state. And so the idea is, get past that. And it would be wonderful if we could just do it. And I used to hear this teaching years ago, and I had no idea what they were talking about. It didn't make sense to me, because I was very Rudy-esque in my, in my work. And my work was always to grow and get to some place. You know, and I kept trying and trying and trying. And then I realized, I'm never going to get there. I'm doing everything wrong. I did whatever. It was, it was just incre incredibly impossible to get there. And so I gave up. And when I gave up, as I said in the earlier talk today, I truly surrendered. And that's all Rudy had ever said. Help me to surrender. When I surrendered, I let go of everything. And then I went, oh, and I woke up. 
And I went, oh. And so now I talk about it. Like, I mean, I know it can happen. That's the best thing. I know we can all wake up. It's just, there's no button I can push. And in a way, there's no button you can push. Because you is the ego-minded trying to wake itself up. What's really happening is the self wants to wake the ego-minded thing up. And that, that's a, there's, a, there's a discourse to be had. You talking to yourself, saying, please help me, please help me. And then it, then it happens. That's not a question? No. Oh. I'm scratching the head. Oh. <laughs> Looked really important for a minute. <laughs> okay. Please. Is it the ego that makes it so hard to want to give up yourself? Yes. Yes. The ego, the I, in the I am, people think it's this, the person. The I am, everyone, people say I am originally. They're basically saying I am, and then they add to that a person, a name, a body. I live in a, in, a, in a particular locale. It gets, it gets dense with impacting qualities. That's the ego. The I am is the ego without any identifying qualities. And what it really is, is the self speaking. I am. And when the I am absolutely reveals itself without any conditioning, it's like, I have always been I am. I, have, I am endlessly what I am. I am that I am. Be still and know that I am. This is all in the Bible. You know, this is the great teaching. But the ego is the last thing to figure it out. In fact, the ego does everything to obscure it. That's why I talked this morning about I am spiritual. That's that's an that's a trap like any other trap. You know, I I am you know I'm a doctor. I am a healer. I am a blah, blah, blah. You find the stuff you do, the stuff that's being done, it's not what you are or who you are. And when you let go of all that stuff emotionally and eternally and you stop reinforcing the ego mind, you get free. It really just falls away. And there you are. It's, nothing, it's not a new space. You don't discover it as something like, oh my God, I never imagined. It's just the opposite. It's like, oh, of course. It's so simple. I get it. That's all it is. And the ego, the ego doesn't go away. It just becomes subsumed by bigness in which it's contained. The infinite and the little tiny finite spark. And that little fin finite spark is still functioning and it's going to not go on for very long. It's going to and then you'll just be I am. That's the projection. I mean, again, a lot of people when they do spiritual work, their real underlying motivation is terror of death, fear of death. That's I mean, kind of motivates people more than almost anything, fear of death. Most people want a spiritual life so they can get beyond death or find a peace in death or get to heaven when they do die rather than go to wherever they fear they're going to go. You know, people, that's another very big motivation for maybe even coming here. But real death and ego death are not exactly the same. But ego death is a recognition of the vast thing that never really dies. The thing that you ultimately are. And it's a kind of getting beyond death, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't die because the ego is still going to pop at some point. But you, you will continue. You may not like it. That's a whole other story, <laughs> you know. You have to learn to accept infinite. You have to learn to accept eternity, and the infinite, and the bigness of this, and the uncaringness of it. It's not. It's not in love with you. I mean, that's. I mean, again, I can go on and on. You don't want to hear that part of this, but it's a very big. It's a very big unfolding that takes place, and ultimately, we are the totality. And as long as there's any reaction to totality, that's the part that's got to be burned away. So if you start to find you are one with everything, but you're a little anxious about this thing, that little anxiety is going to become the focus of all your attention. And it's going to have to be <laughs> broken down because otherwise you are going to be trapped with that little spark of ego that actually is resisting the infinite. So everything in you that's uncomfortable is going to get put into play. Every bit of fear, every bit of discomfort, every bit of anxiety is all, you're going to have to burn through all of it or basically go, okay, even this. And that's all you do. It's a big ride. And, you know, it's hard to talk about. 
it's hard to express really what's going on here. The more I go into it, the harder it is to put words, although you wouldn't believe that because I keep talking, but it really, it really is hard to get at what it truly is. I can only approximate it and try a little bit to sell you on that this is worth it. I don't know if I'm doing a good job or not, but I'm trying to make you understand that this is inevitable one way or the other. This is the life we're in. And waking up to life is what this journey is about. So this is, this is where we're headed. If you want to go there, go there now. If you don't want to do it now, trust me, the universe has billions and billions of years and lifetimes to allow you to arrive at this space. Billions of years. You know, it doesn't care. You're the one. It's really it's your, your decision. What do you want? Do you want to wake up or do you want to stay asleep? You know, sleeping is suffering. Life is suffering, according to Buddha. That's what it is. Because nothing satisfies, ultimately. Even when the thing does satisfy, it gets taken away. So, find truth. Truly residing in one's being, truly being, is a very vulnerable and raw place. For and who? For the self-construct. Yes. Because the question arises of, Who will I be if there's no one to protect and defend anymore? Good question. And You'll the find world, out. It, it's, there's always something coming at you. You could be truly yourself and someone's not going to like that. And they will say something mean to you. You know, this is always unfolding, churning. Mahatma, so Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi was staring at a gun that was about to kill him. And he went, Om Namah Shivaya. Om is the name of Shiva. He saw it as God. Gone. It's kind of where you want to live. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard for the ego mind to do that. But when you're really, really open, and you've really begun to experience some kind of trust, yes, the ego mind is going to be fearful. You know, it'll, it'll still have its little dramas to play out. But the reality is you're bigger than that. You are the, you are the vast consciousness in which your little drama is playing out. So you're going to be able to be in both perspectives at the same time. That larger perspective is very assuring. You can allow yourself to go through the drama because you know deep down you are not ever going to be extinguished. Not in the way you think. It's, it's kind of like that self-construct that you say. It doesn't exist if, if the self is itself. The ego is the thing that's trying to tell you. It's real. That, that, that's exactly, real. that's right. The ego is trying to tell you that it's real, and that's the source of the problem. But, but, but I have to say, even in the awakened construct, the ego is still, a, as long as you have a body and a mind, it's still going to be there. And your body is not going to like pain. It is not going to want to be extinguished. It just won't. And most of the day, you won't have to deal with that. But there will come times where you will have to deal with it. And then what do you do? You know, it's really, you, you don't know what you're going to do until you're in it, but I described this car crash that Blanche and I were in you know, last year, and as a car was coming right at me in a T-bone, I looked at it, and my only thought was, and I've said this before, boy, this is inconvenient. <laughs> I thought it would be, ah! Nothing like that. Nothing like that. I just said, now? Did really? I had my last week, and... As I approach the telephone pole, yeah. the last thing I said, is this how it ends? Yeah, yeah. That's, well, that's kind of what it comes down to. It's rather mundane and innocuous, the final moments in many ways. And people are they're not prepared for it. We all think of our last moments as being um, grandiose in some way, you know, bedside goodbyes and all of that stuff. Most of the time it's like, gone, finished. And you don't have much time to deal with it. So, yeah, one of, the, one of the best things to do in preparation for that kind of ignominious, what's the word? Uh, I can't say it. One of those departures where you, where you really feel it's not fair is get, prepare for it now. Make all of your goodbyes. Tell everyone you know that you love, that you love them. Have it all done, all finished, so that everything is complete, so that at any given moment when this happens, you are you're free. You go, okay, bye. You know? Because, because it may well end like that. I mean, honestly, you don't, you never, never know. You know, I mean, 
if you've listened to any of my talks from the last few weeks, you know, I, I've talked a lot about uh, people who had dramatic death recently and uh, totally unexpected and how it shattered lives. And there's, it just happens, man. It just happens. So if you, if you think you're going to buy yourself out of that one, it, that doesn't happen. But if you can find a way to love life, I think, that's my sense of it, and appreciate its impermanence, you will be ready for whatever the next step is. You know, you never know in the next step that you're going to hit solid ground. And if you live in where we do, in San Francisco or Los Angeles, that ground could give way at any instant in a very big way. So every moment that it's solid is an amazing miracle. You're being supported, but you have to be ready for it to give way. So this is just part of being really deeply open, really aware of totality. And you are totality. Really, I mean, the most beautiful sense of it, you are totality. You are everything you've been ever wanting to become, you already are that. You're already beautiful, you're already wonderful, you're already joyous, you're already vast in your awareness. Celebrate. Celebrate this life instead of fighting it. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to describe the eternity you're talking about? Uh, not in a way that would totally make sense. Okay. Um, I've had good versions of it and bad versions of it. The good version is total love and beauty. The bad version is just a computer program. <laughs> and I don't know which is which. And my son convinced me that whatever version I pick is just a story. <laughs> None of it's true. It's a story beyond understanding. You can't figure it out. It can be horrific and it can be beautiful. I don't really know. I think if it is one or the other to you, the problem is that you're still there to have it be mean something to you. And that's the thing that's got to get washed out and will be eradicated. Ultimately, you will be eradicated. I hate to tell you, you know, but you do not survive in eternity as a person. You will become one with it, but in becoming one with eternity, there won't be any one reacting to it. There won't be you and it. There will just be what is already in place, and this is it. This is it. Even though you have a mind and a body and a personality right now and an ego, this too is it. Total par par paradox, but this is, this is it. And when you suddenly get that, it's like, ah, and you stop caring. You stop figuring it out. I, I'm getting stupider by the hour. I really am. I get stupider by the hour, and it's great. Because I just walk around like a little kid going, ooh, 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 ooh. I literally do that. You know, I walk down the street and, I, you know, I literally, I touch flowers. I touch blades of grass. I go, oh. I'm just like, where do they, why? So beautiful. It's so amazing. That really is what takes place. That's the journey right now. I get younger every day. I'm going to forget all of your names pretty soon. You know, I'm just going to be this guy who's walking around going, <laughs> And that'll be that. And, you know, no more talking. You have the tapes. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the dream. And um, I haven't heard you say this much before. And when you say, except what is, it seems like a paradox to me. Because you're saying what is, and that you're saying that's a dream. Yeah. But and then, and also, just one more thing is mm -hmm. the body. Like, the body, like you said, it feels pain. It, I mean, it feels real when we have our senses. So how does all those three things fit together? Well, again, I'm going to throw you into the virtual reality, where you're, you're, you're in a world that is absolutely three-dimensionally alive. And there you are, and it's completely fabricated. If some technicians put it together, or they shot the place. You know, you can go from one world to another world to another world and go, oh my God, oh my God, this is, this is fan fantastic. You know, and I, I have these tools, and I, if I go see a doorway, I can't walk as far as the door because you're in a little room. So you have to push a little button, and phew, you're pushed into the next room. You go, you go through this doorway, you go through that doorway, you can go all over the place, and you're going, this is extraordinary. Where, where, who am I? Where am I? You know, and that's 
a game that we're playing in the 21st century, and it's only the beginning of that game. Life, as we're living it right now, is far more a virtual reality than a reality, I think. And we'll call, a dream was what they called it in Taoist time. Let's call it a virtual reality for now. Waking up to that virtual reality is probably something that's going to be happening more and more because the idea of virtual reality is going to become such a powerful idea for the 21st century people. You know, we're going to see this world and go, why is this different than that? It's not. And the resolution of these worlds are so fine that it really, you can't tell. So, what about like pain in the body? Is that not real on some level? Well, of course it's real. It's transitory, but it's real. Yeah, no, we all, we all experience it. And we all fear, fear pain in the body, which I think is what keeps us safe most of the time. That's its positive sign. And the bad part is you often leave the world in it, in that pain. And I think it probably is a signal to the body to get you out of here. You know, I, this is, I can't take any more. You're gone, I think. You know, but one way or the other, it's part of the construct. And it what does have to be dealt with. It's part of what, what's going on here. And there's no easy way. I, I, you know, I do this a lot. I talk about Christ on the cross. And I talk about the pain that he's in on the cross, and he's asking God, he says, why have you forsaken me? And then somewhere, moments later, that's not described how long or what is the reasoning behind it, but somehow he goes from his suffering and being forsaken into forgive them for they know not what they do. That transition is a transition I believe we all go through, from our own pain into compassion for all pain, the pain of all human beings. That's really what happens. And I think the awakening process is the beginning of that. My journey now is a journey into um, unbearable compassion and empathy. I cannot stop empathizing with every life I see in front of me. And every one that passes in front of me with every newscast. I can't even watch movies anymore because the drama is too much for me. I just have to stop. It's just, I, I don't want that. It's too deep. It's too hard. And so I just try to live sending out as much love and care as I humanly can to the world and feel a compassion that is not so Bruce can be like a compassionate person. It's because I, it's what's coming through. It's just compassion. And that's what we end up in. The way Christ ended up on the cross, for, you know, looking at all these people and asking for their forgiveness. That's, we're all heading in that direction. And, that, and, he, and he's... He's a great teacher. The Christ teaching, in my, in my mind, that's the core. The core teaching. You know, to go from me to thou. Powerful. Would you say that Christ was in the dream when he was saying, why have you forsaken me? I, let me put it this way. I mean, my, I, it's hard to really know Christ in that way. My, word, my feeling is he was awake. And, but... I, I know awake people. If you were nailing, if you were going to nail me to a cross, I would be very unhappy. <laughs> the dream would be very persistent. I would suffer beyond anything I know, and with some kind of grace and blessing, I would arrive where Christ arrived, and I would see beyond my own pain, beyond the dream, beyond the last vestiges of the dream, into truth, and that would be the heart of forgiveness caring, compassion, and love, which ultimately, to me, is the center of, of it all. I think that's where we end up. The ultimate awakened state is a state of love. I'm, I'm saying, I don't know if that's true, but that's my story. And if I'm wrong, you can yell at me. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think I am. I don't think I am. I think love is the ultimate reason for this and the place we come from and the place we return to. And I think that's why you want compassion for everybody because why are people here treating each other so badly and misunderstanding the joy of this space and the wonder of this dream and not understanding that this dream is a gift, it's beautiful and it can be a wondrous experience. Having a life is extraordinary. Having a life, coming into life is one of the great boons of existence. That's why it, existence has happened for us to be here. All existence is for us to be here. 
to do it, to use it badly just is such a sad thing. And whether it's a dream or not a dream, it's what we've got. And waking up, waking up is revelation to the profound love that we come from. Anybody else? I just said one more thought. Um, mm-hmm. How do you justify the, the vicious criminals that we have? I don't. We can't. Well, look, I mean, yeah, you can go back very quickly and just look at their childhood and you'll probably get the whole answer. If you want to trace it back to something, and if you want to be karmic about it, trace it back to 40 lifetimes before, people be treating each other badly in families and in all these different places. What comes out of that? Rage. True rage. And you want to destroy everything and destroy people and other people and yourself included. And it's a pretty bad space to be in. But ultimately, you know, the guys who speared Christ in the... In the, in the belly and the side, you know, we're probably somewhat rageful people, you know, for lots of good reasons, but produces tragedy, and it happens all around us, and we turn on the news, you'll see it, you know, so all, all we can be responsible for is our rage and our transition beyond rage, or whatever it is we have inside us. Some of us have great suffering, and some of us have um, less of it. But whatever you find, that's your path. That's yours, and you got it for a reason, and it's not more than you can handle. And when you work through, you will be free. Be liberated. Um, I'm struggling with the story that Christ died for our sins, and that little children see this Christ on the cross bleeding for their sins. Do you think that's a story that came afterwards? And it possibly wasn't his story that we were born that I, I actually th- he was going to die for our sins? No, I actually think he did. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I have to say, in your last moments in this world where you are suddenly understanding agony and you suddenly are able to look to forgive them for they know not what they do, when you're suddenly able to look at the possibility of a life beyond, you will gravitate toward those teachings if you're a Christian in a very big way and it will get you through. I think it's really great teaching and I think Christ really did die for our sins and was able to teach us as a result of it how to look into infinity and know that we will go way beyond the sufferings of our body. We will, go be, we will transcend it. So I, I've, I've come to that in my years of practice. It feels, that feels right. The only part that that I really struggle with is the idea that these babies are born in sin, that they are... That well, I, I can't address that really exactly. I mean, I don't know yeah. why people say we were born in sin. We're just born, you know? And we're born in a world of, of, of com- complication. Yeah. It's a world of struggle, and we all know that. But in that struggle, what do we find? Every so often, i be very personal here, I hug my grandchildren, and I would endure anything that life had to throw at me to have that experience of that hug. My grandson says, me love you, Papu. Everything, everything comes from that. So I would enter a world of, of great hostility and everything else that we see around us to touch that love and to know that love. And I do feel it. And I feel it back for everybody in this room and everybody I know and everyone I see on the street at this point, I just go, so much love. It's really so beautiful. And that's what we all can do. We're all vessels of that love if we want to be. you know. And if we don't want to be, we can be miserable and caught in our drama. Big choice. I like the love part. If you simply shut your mouth. Go fast. <laughs> if you simply are, can you self-observe, or is that self-observation part just what's left of the ego, and does it always taste? It's really interesting. Yeah, the ego pops up occasionally, but it's not self-observation, it's knowing. It's not even someone, something knowing it's something, it's just knowing. No, there's, it's just, again, the clearest I can present it is, wow. Okay. 
I'm going to run you through this again tomorrow, guys. Um, if you want to show up, you don't have to show up because I got nothing new to say. At any any one of these any one of these talks, really, are they're wildly repetitive, and uh, the only value of it is the moment of it. The unfolding of the moment is valuable, and putting sitting together in satsang, sitting together as a collective, is a shared space where this expression of love and clear clarity, hopefully is made known. And there's something very special about it. And as I often say to people, where else do you get this? You don't get it in watching TV, you don't get it at the movies, maybe reading certain books or novels. Maybe it happens, but it's happening here. We get to dialogue with, it may not sound like a dialogue because I'm pontificating, but we really do get to share this kind of expression. And it's very, um, it's very freeing in the end. I promise you it's freeing. Whenever you arrive at freedom, you will go thank you. And it won't be thankful thank you to me, because you'll recognize very clearly that the thank you goes to that which created you. <laughs>